Well, we are continuing, kind of, kind of continuing in our series. What I mean by that is that we did finish the book of Jude. And so we've been in the book of Jude for the last four weeks, and we've been talking about defending the faith. And today we're going to start what I would call an extension to that as far as what we've been talking about defending the faith. And I want to talk, with our, the, the title of this series is Lost and Found, but why sharing the faith or why defending the faith matters. And so it's not just about um, having arguments. It's not just about preservation of our faith, but what we want to do is we want to be sure that we realize that, again, this isn't just about knowing things. This isn't just about knowing what the right or wrong answers are. This isn't just about knowing questions or how to answer questions. Some of you, and I appreciate that, you submitted questions. I asked you to share with me some of the questions that some of the people that you may have engaged with in the past that they had about Christianity or why they were not following the Lord. And some of you answered those questions. But in our series in Jude, what we did was we looked at the importance of us defending the faith. And so over the next few weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to continue the discussion of defending the faith, answering some of the questions that you have, and hopefully encouraging you into missionary or missional living. We're all called to be missionaries in this world. We're not all called to go overseas. That's not everybody's calling, but every one of us is called to be part of the mission. And so a few weeks back, I shared with you um, about a brother of mine. He challenged me. We sat down and we had lunch. And just for those of you that may not have heard the story, but we had lunch. And in our conversation over lunch, he shared with me what God was doing in his life. I was sharing what God was doing in my life. And then he said, hey, man, why don't you, you know, come with me to go and knock on people's doors? And I was like, hallelujah. <laughs> You know, because it's easy, right? Like this right in here, this is easy stuff. This is, this, this, in this place, worship is easy, right? Our, our music ministry, come on, give them a hand. They, they lead us. I mean, it's easy to join them in song, right? It's, it's simple to do that. It's, it's easy to get up and, and, and share the word of God. Now, it's not easy for everybody to get up here and preach, right? Like if I, if I said, Hey, here's the mic, like some of you like, no, get away from me. Be like hot potato, you know, throwing the mic to each other, something like that. But nonetheless, it is, this is the easy part. But when you talk about going out into the world and living a life of worship, that's a different thing. So what I did was rather than give him the 19 excuses that I have in my back pocket, hallelujah. You know, my schedule, my school, my family, my dog, like all, everything else that we can say, I knew that the Lord was speaking to me and I said, yes. And we went out, I share with you one of the times we went out, the second time I didn't share that story with you. But I want us to realize, as I, I was sharing with Pastor Aldo, him and I, for those of you that don't know, I think that you should know, but on Friday, the first Friday of every month, we have a time of prayer and worship, a time of intercession where we gather together and we come before the Lord as a body of believers collectively. And I thank God because I have seen the numbers growing and the people that are coming, but I'll never be satisfied until every single one of you is in here crying out to God, worshiping and seeking the Lord together with us on that first fight of the month. But nonetheless, afterward is when we have our elder meeting and Pastor Aldo and I presently are the elders in this church. And we were having this conversation and we were talking about, you know, us growing as disciples. And if you've been at Corfe Church for the last five years, you've probably read five books or complained about it. Hello. But we have, a, we have equipped you, right? We have said, hey, this is what it means to multiply. Y'all know Francis Chan. Come on now. <laughs> we took you through rooted, right? We're like, hey, you know, we want to help people understand what small group life is supposed to be about. And, you know, and some of you, man, you could check the book. I mean, you could check, you know, the list of books. You've read them all. You've studied them all. And here's my question for you. Are you living them all? Are you multiplying? Are you extending the kingdom? Are you, are you applying? Because you know what I have found about Christians, especially in America? It's like we, we just gain knowledge, gain knowledge, gain knowledge, gain knowledge. We've read the book. We've done the study. We did the small group. We participate. We know it. We can regurgitate it. But we're not living it. We're not living it. We're not, we're not living what God wants us to live. And so 
I'm like, man, this, this series is so very important for us. And so I'm going to ask my brother Scott Projan to come up here. Would you put your hands together for him? He's going to share with us. Thank you, sir. It's my buddy. I'm going to ask him a, a couple of questions. And uh, I just want to, can, can, can we acknowledge his family here? Beautiful family. Give him a hand. Carol. I remember Carol's name. What's your name again? Chris? Grace, Grace, all right, very good. So thank you guys so much for being with us today. But I want you to go ahead and share. So the first thing is just kind of tell us your faith journey. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> I grew up in a, in a wonderful family, loving father and mother. But Christ, God, church wasn't part of our upbringing, my upbringing. And so when I hit my 20s, I was kind of left to my own devices in terms of what I was supposed to figure out about life and what it was to be a man and, and to set my own values. And so by the end of my 20s and having lived it as the world would say to live it, I was rather bankrupt. I really came to the end of myself at that time, really searching and looking for something else. And at that, at that time, at that point in my life, Something changed, radically changed. One afternoon on a Friday after work, I got a phone call from a deputy sheriff in, in California where my mother lived. My folks were, had been divorced for about four years at that point. And he said, I'm, I've got some bad news for you. I, your mother's been found dead. And she had died of a massive coronary. And she, living alone, hadn't been found for about four days. So dealing with that sudden loss and that tragedy was, was very difficult. But in working through this, I also came to the realization that I was going to have to, you know, the face of God someday as a mortal being. And I realized that my life was not very honorable. It wasn't really reflective of what God would have me to be. I didn't know him, but I knew that. And I knew of Jesus here, but I didn't have him here. If That resonates with you all. And so what I did is I cried out to Jesus. I said, I need you right now, Lord. I need you in my life. And he came into my life and changed my life. Didn't come in and it wasn't critical of my lifestyle and all the rest, but over time revealed to me that some of the things that I thought were important weren't important. Some of the things that I felt were my value system weren't really truly the proper value system. And so I went from being one who lived in the culture to being a biblical Christian and following his, his, his uh, ideals, his values. Yeah, that's yeah. good. It's powerful. Um, so how or why, this kind of both-hand question, did you start going door-to-door -door praying for people? Well, this kind of goes back uh, many years ago. You, some of you may know about evangelism explosion. That was uh, a a course, if you will, within churches about 25, 30 years ago where they taught you how to evangelize and going into neighborhoods and this type of thing. I had become involved in that at that particular time, and it introduced me to it in terms of sharing my faith. But as with many programs, that one kind of came and went, and I, life got busy. I stepped out of that and wasn't very involved. But over the last 30 years of living in, in Oviedo, there's always been a consistent couple groups that come to the door knocking, ringing the doorbell that are trying to share a faith. Now, some of you know who they may be, who I'm referencing here, but the faith that they're sharing isn't that Jesus is the son of God, that Jesus is God. They don't have that faith. And I realized at that point, at some point, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to do for the truth what other people do for a lie. Mm. I want you to share the truth of who I am. And God gave me that seed. He planted it in there. And it's, maybe you can resonate with this as well. I didn't really act upon it at that time. But then within the last year, he continued to speak to me and said, go forth, do what I've asked you to do. And with COVID being what COVID is and people being so distant, so isolated, so removed, anxieties, depressions, these kinds of things. What better time than this to reaching out in the community, connecting people with people, letting them know that there's a loving God who cares about them, hasn't forsaken them or forgotten them. So that's how we, we really started getting back into this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very good. 
And so in that, what has been your worst experience doing this? Well, you realize when you go out and you do this, and, and I've, whenever I go out, we pray before we do this, realizing that we're walking in enemy territory, right? The, the, this is not, y'all aren't, aren't that here, but obviously out there, there's going to be people that don't go to church, don't care about anything associated with God. So we walked into this one neighborhood, rang this doorbell, and one of the largest guys I've ever seen in my life opened up the door. He was about wide, about that tall. Can we say Goliath? <laughs> so he, he, he was very big. I didn't bring my stones that day, so I knew I was in trouble. So he comes to the door, and we, as what we just share with people, we go, we're in a neighborhood. We're trying to offer hope and encouragement. We're Christians. We'd love to pray with you if you like prayer. Christians! I said, yes, sir. I don't want you here. I don't want you in my house. I don't want you in my neighborhood. So he, he, was, he was very forceful, very large presence, could be very intimidating, but realizing that we had prayed and we had God on our side, we weren't afraid. We were respectful. We left, and then we continued on, realizing that God had a work for us to do. So we pressed forward with that and didn't let that intimidation cause us to shrink back and leave then. And so then some really great things happened even that same day after that initial visit. Yeah, so go ahead and tell us your best experience. Well, after we left him and we went a little bit further, we came across an individual who we had met just a few weeks prior to that. And this individual is only 14 years old. He lives alone with his mother. His father had died when he was a baby. His mother has some, um, some physical conditions that she's dealing with. Uh, but we were able to pray with them before connecting with him, talking about Forge, which is a men's Bible study that, that we're a part of. And uh, I had invited him at that time. I ran into him again and reconnected with him. And he said, hey, that Bible study you were talking about, I, I want to be a part of that. I said, that's great. So now he's been coming for the last several weeks. This is a young man who, who's looking for growing his relationship with Jesus, and he needs mentors in his life. He needs other men to speak truth into his life and to, and to help grow him into the man that God would have him to be. As God defines greatness in men, that's, that's, that's what's going on there. So that was exciting. Then we went right around a corner and came across a young man who opened up the door, had a cross around his neck, told him what we were there for. And he said, yes, I'd like you to pray for my family. I said, you know, COVID's been very hard for us. My father is struggling in his, in his work. There's a lot of anger in our family. This is a Christian family. This is real, right? This is real. So I was able, we were able to minister to our brother in Christ there by praying with him and encouraging his family. And he said, I'm really so glad that you came. I really needed that. And that's kind of the resounding thing that we're hearing is that people really need this. You know, they're disconnected. They feel very alone. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's encouraging, but I would just give you one more shot. How would you encourage the church to be more outwardly focused? Okay. Well, I just want to say that I'm a very ordinary guy, very ordinary. I'm no different than anyone else in this room. You could say kind of a, as a nothing. You know, nobody would know me if I walked down the street. But God can take ordinary things or nothing and make great things. Do extraordinary work through just ordinary people. He's done that. He's just in reading the Bible countless times. And so for such a time as this, we're all here. God's called us for a purpose and so reaching out to your neighbors, reaching out in your neighborhoods and connecting with people that are disconnected, that are broken, they want this. They're hungry to hear good news. They're hungry to be encouraged. They're, they're, they need hope in their life where there is no hope and where there is discouragement. And so I would encourage you, just, just like me, we're just ordinary people, but to go two by two into a neighborhood to, to ring a doorbell and to offer. And we always ask permission every step of the way. May we, may we, may we. And they say, yes, yes, yes. That's where God's moving. We never force something upon somebody that what, what they don't want. 
but the receptivity has been incredible. And some of the experiences have been just phenomenal in terms of the people that we met with. When we went out, we connected with a young man that had just moved here and he was a Christian and he felt the need for that fellowship. Another one, a neighbor further down, moved in from New York. His name is Barry. Um, and he prayed to receive Christ. And, uh, you know, we, what's interesting is all these people have names. Uh, Christina sitting at, at a, at a uh, kitchen table praying for her finances. And, and you could see the anguish in her face when she came to the door. And we were able to pray with her. Um, you know, uh, Eric, the, one, the young man with the cross. Ryan, we went to his door, a young man. He prayed for us. So God is moving generationally in all these generations. And people would say, well, there's, God's not moving in this younger generation. I would say, then you come out with me and notice this younger generation, there's the spirit of God is moving in a mighty way. And I think mighty things and wonderful, powerful things are gonna happen as a result of it. So I would just encourage you to come on out and let's give it a try. Amen. Yeah. Come on, put your hands together. Yeah. It's Scott. Thank you, my bro. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. And so, you know, Minister John, he's always making sure that he keeps me on my toes. So if you would like more information and you would like to go out and join or just kind of, you know, talk with Scott, I encourage you, make sure you talk to him after the service. He'll be here to encourage you. And the one thing that I, that I absolutely love about Scott is, you know, when we go, and I love this because just his heart of humility. And he says this, and I laugh every time that he says it. He's like, hey, I'm nobody. You know, he's the pastor. And I'm like, no, we're not. <laughs> and I, I don't love that. I'm just like, this guy is okay. But it's, but it's his heart. His heart is like, I'm no one. I, I don't, I just, he's, he's just someone, right? He's, he's someone trying to tell everybody about Jesus. That's, that's it. That's our heart. And that's what we should want to do. And as again, I was sharing with Pastor Aldo and we were talking about you, you know, not talking bad about you. We're just trying to, we want to encourage you. And so that is the purpose for this series called Lost and Found. And so if you have your Bible, if you would open to the, to the gospel of Luke, the gospel of Luke, this is a familiar passage of scripture. And if you would stand with me to read the word of God, the gospel of Luke chapter 15, and we are going to read beginning in verse 11, Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. When you got it, say so. And it says, then he said, this is Jesus speaking, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said, to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he had came, when he, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a, far, a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this. This my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Let us pray. Father, thank you so very, very much for your goodness. Thank you so much for 
the grace that you have shown us. Thank you for these reminders that you have before us in your word of the rescue mission that you came on. I thank you for my brother Scott and not just by him inspiring and challenging me, but others and Lord God, other pastors and Lord, just using him. And I just pray, Father, that we would hear from your throne today. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Be glorified in our time together. We pray this all in Jesus' good name. And everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want you to think about this this morning because as we're talking about defending the faith, but our motivation to defend the faith should not be solely preservation, but expansion. Our motivation to defend the faith should not be solely preservation, but expansion. So when we read and we went through the, the, the book of Jude, we saw that Jude was writing to the church. And I said this multiple times that when we're talking about defending the faith, this isn't about making the world believe like we believe. This isn't about when we go to doors to knock on, on people's doors, we're not trying to make them believe what we believe and not make a commitment to Christ. No, we are presenting them with the, with, with the Christ and we are offering them the opportunity to be prayed for. But we're not expecting people who don't make a commitment to Jesus just because we knocked on their door to suddenly live holy. Hello. That's not what this is about. It is, it is about us when we're talking about defending the faith. It is ensuring that what we believe is clear because in our day, what is happening in the church is the same thing that was happening in the book of Jude and the same exact thing that happened in the Garden of Eden when Satan brought into question the words of God. And he caused uh, Eve to question, well, did God really say that? And as a result of her questioning that and Adam responding in kind, rather than correcting the, the miscommunication, if you will, he fell into that and sin entered the world. And then when you fast forward after Jesus dies, rises again, sends his apostles, they begin to plant churches. Guess what happens? The deceiver is still there trying to call into question what God said. And so there is a preservative side of defending the faith. We should be preserving the faith, but it can't just be about preservation. It has to be about expansion. Now, in order for us to understand this, this, this parable better, we need to have some context, right? We need to see what pro provoked Jesus, because all of us, raise your hand real quick. Are you familiar with this, this passage here, the prodigal son, right? All of us have heard this story in some, some way, shape, or form. And so here's the fact. The fact is we know the story, but do we know the context? Do we know why it is that Jesus spoke this? Well, go back to verse 1 of chapter 15, if you will, and look at what it says there. It says, then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. But, but can we look at verse 1 real quick? Verse 1 says, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. To hear him. Now, we've all probably heard it said, and maybe we've said it before, Jesus ate with tax collectors. He ate with sinners, and we get into that conversation. And many times, people are not using that in a missional sense. They're using that in a justification sense. They're not using it because they want to be around sinners for the sake of their souls. They want to be around sinners for the sake of their flesh. Hello. They want to be around ungodly people, not because they want to bring them to the kingdom, but because they can relax around them. Now, I want, now, now, now this is really important because it's, I pointed this out. Verse one says what? It says they came to hear him. So can we, can we think about what Jesus was saying? Because the Pharisees were like, yo, this guy receives sinners. And, and, and what's crazy to me is that Jesus is there. He is communicating to them. And then what happens is he goes ahead and he tells them, well, let me tell you this, this parable. Tells him the parable of the lost sheep. Then he tells him the parable of a lost coin. And then he tells them a parable that has to deal with the one of the lost son. He does all of that. But I want to go back because I want us to see what Jesus was saying to these tax collectors and these sinners. I want us to see this. So go back to chapter 14 with me, if you would. Verse 25. 
just a little bit back. He says this, it says, now great multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them. So, so just think about it for a moment. These great multitudes of sinners, of tax collectors, of ungodly people, they're all coming to Jesus. And this is what he turns and says to them. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Talk about a church growth plan. The first message he says is the absolutely most radical message. The multitudes come, the sinners come to hear what Jesus is saying. And what does Jesus do? Jesus lays it down for them and says, hey, if you're going to follow me, this is what it means. If you're going to follow me, this is what it means. But let's continue. He goes on and said, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, as at all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able to come with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. You know what Jesus was doing right here? Defending the faith. You know what he was doing? He was making it clear. This is what it means to be my follower. This is what it means to be one who follows me. This is the message that the sinners and tax collectors are coming back to hear more of. Hello. They weren't coming back because he was being seeker sensitive and he was making people feel good and just smile all the time. Hello. I wouldn't be. Listen, when I was reading this, I could feel some of y'all like, hate my husband, my wife, come on now. It, 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 that, that's uncomfortable to hear these words. And in your head, you're like, well, did Jesus really mean? Yeah, Jesus really meant that in the, in, in the context of what he was communicating. He is elevating our commitment to him. And if your commitment to Jesus is not so great and so real and so true that no other love in your life compares, man, you better question, are you really following him? It's not just about preservation, it's about expansion. It's about expanding the kingdom, but expanding it correctly. Expanding it the way, because we cannot lower the bar. We cannot change the gospel. We cannot accommodate to people's sin if we're going to expand the kingdom. You know me, I'm, I'm not a... You know, Scott and I, we prayed for the gentleman, Barry, still pray for him and pray that God would draw him near. But I'm not, I'm not one of those, you know, sinner's prayer type guys. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a guy that wants to believe the scriptures. And I, and I want to call you to a faith in Christ that is real, right? That is based on what the apostles would say. And so what do the scriptures say? The scriptures say, say a prayer. That's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures say you must repent and believe. And so the way that this message was inspired was on a Tuesday of this last week as I was, you know, I'm praying and I'm not praying at that moment, but I'm praying and, I'm, and I know what I'm, you know, I had already talked to Scott about sharing. And so I already knew where we were going with the message. I was just not clear. Like, okay, Lord, where is it? You know, what is it exactly that, you know, you want me to communicate from your word? And so Josiah and I, you know, we're sitting down Tuesday night. Elaine leads the, the Women's Connect. And so I'm doing, you know, the, the bedtime duty because Josiah loves, and when I say loves, he kicks me out all the time from the nighttime routine, you know. He likes to snuggle with his mom. He likes her to read the scriptures with him. They pray together and stuff like that. And so I'm like, well, praise the Lord. But Tuesday night, you're stuck with me, bro. 
And, you know, I don't know about your kids. I know my kids. My kids are very, they, they got something from their dad. They are very persistent. Hallelujah. They, you know, once they get their mind on something, they're not stopping. And my son asked me, you know, a few, a few times already, he's like, we're having a conversation about totally nothing that has to do with what I'm about to say. And out of the blue, he's like, well, why can't I be baptized? And I'm like, what? I'm like, Josiah, you got to be a little bit older to be baptized. And so, you know, we start to have the conversation. And so this particular night, I'm in the room with him. And out of nowhere, he says, well, why can't I be baptized? And I'm like, Josiah. Now, I'm going somewhere with this because I'm, I'm, I'm talking about commitment, and I'm talking to my seven-year-old son. And I'm like, listen, do you understand what baptism is? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, well, Josiah, what is it? And he's like, well, it's when you make a commitment to Jesus. And I'm like, okay, 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 yes. <laughs> I'm like, okay, let's go a little deeper than this because I think we need to get a little bit more. I'm like, because you can make a commitment to Jesus without being baptized. Like, you have to understand the significance of this. And so I'm like, well, you know, Josiah, in order for you to make a commitment to Jesus, you have to repent of your sin. And, he, and I'm like, do you know what it means? And you're like, a seven-year-old talking about repentance? Yeah, well, I'm like, do you know what repentance is? And he's like, no. And I'm like, okay, well, repent means to change your mind. It means to turn away from your, you know, your sin and to think differently. And he was like, okay. And I said, do you know what sin is? He's like, yeah, doing things that are wrong. And I'm like, okay, you're good. You're going on the right track. And so I open up his, his Bible for the, his Bible reading for the night and we're reading the prodigal son. And so as we're reading the prodigal son, I'm like, wow, you want to talk about like evangelism 101? Hello, this is it. And so he's like, you know, he, he was, he was drinking his, his milk before bed and he pulled, you know, he's like, okay, well, he's like, wait, I know that story. And I'm like, okay, so tell me the story. So he starts explaining me the story. He breaks it all down and he's, and I'm like, okay, well, that's good. And so I'm like, and then what do you think the next question is? Well, why can't I be baptized? <laughs> I'm like, Lord. And I said, Josiah, let me ask you a question. I said, do you believe? I said, the Bible says you have to believe. I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? And he's like, yes. I'm like, amen. I'm like, do you believe that Jesus died for your sin and that he rose again? That he, and he said, yes. And I'm like, oh my goodness, hallelujah. And I said, all right, Josiah. I said, do you want to put your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you want Jesus to be the leader and the Lord of your life? And he was like, yes. And I'm like, amen. And I said, so do you want to pray? And he was like, yes. I said, all right, we're going to pray. So I get down on my knees and normally he's laying down, you know, and I'm like, you got to sit up for this one. This is serious, bro. Like, you can't be laying down and accepting Jesus. Like, you know, this is not a counseling couch here. And so, <laughs> so he sits up, opens his big eyes, and I'm like, all right, you ready to praise, I guess? I'm like, okay, repeat after me. And so I didn't do a traditional sinner's prayer. I probably didn't even do a prayer that was traditional for a seven-year-old. I'm like making it as long and as elaborate as I can. And it was so silent and, and just holy in that moment he prayed every one of those words. And as, a, as any dad or mom would do, I pray for him afterwards. And I'm crying because I'm like, God, I can't believe this. <laughs> and I finish praying and I pick up my head and I look at him and he starts crying. And I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, I'm just so happy. <laughs> and I was like, praise the Lord. So y'all pray for my son. Amen. He's going to be baptized soon. All right. Not yet. I, st I still feel like he needs to understand it a little bit more. But nonetheless, I share this story because defending the faith in an evangelistic context is not just about preservation, it's about expansion. But no matter if it's a seven-year-old or a 70-year-old, we need to get the gospel correct. We need to call people to a real faith in a real Jesus, not lowering the bar for anyone. And when we look at this, this re retelling of this story of the prodigal son, what do we have going on? What, what, what do we see happening here is Jesus has just finished communicating some truth to these folks and letting them know, hey, to follow me means this. We come to this story of the prodigal son. And so the first thing I would ask you to repeat after me is this, say, rebels do not know they are lost. Rebels do not know that they are lost. And I will go through this. We only have a little bit of time here. But when you look at the, the text, the ver verse 13 says, he journeyed to a far country. Now, I, I want you to realize this, that he didn't stumble there. 
He didn't accidentally, you know, he didn't make a wrong turn somewhere and end up in a far country. Like, like that happened to me one time. Alexis and I, she picked me up from the airport one day and we did not turn on the GPS and I knew where we were going, but I was not paying attention sufficiently. It was dark and I said, baby, just go right. And we went right. And we were having an amazing conversation that seemed to never end and we were never getting to the exit we were supposed to be on. And so we ended up in like almost Cocoa Beach or something like that, right? So it was amazing, you know, you're good. You know, I was, I was out of town for a little while, so it was cool to catch up, glory to God. But we weren't trying to rebel. We just didn't, and then we did turn on the GPS. I'm like, I don't know where I'm going, obviously. So let's go ahead and turn this on. And so we followed the direction and we got home, amen. But nonetheless, it wasn't this for this guy. He didn't make a mistake and turn there. He intentionally made his way there. He thought, this is what he thought. This is what this boy thought. He thought that his freedom had finally, arrived. Hallelujah. He didn't realize he was walking into his worst nightmare. Some of us, you know, we have that, that happened to us. He walked away. The, the rebellion that, that I want you to understand about this young man, the rebellion of the younger son, we think about the prodigal living. We think about the harlots. We think about the money spent. We think about the drugging, the drinking. We think about all of those things. But I want to tell you something that it is that where you see the rebellion of this son is in the rejection of his father. You know what the son said? The son said, dad, give me my inheritance. I wish you were dead. Oh, Bishop, it doesn't say that in the text. It doesn't have to say that in the text. That's what he was saying to his dad. He was saying, listen, I'm not going to wait for you to die to get mine. I want mine now and I'm going to do my thing. I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead. I, 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 I don't even care enough about you to wait. I don't want to be, I don't want to, I don't want to wait till you get old and I got to take care of you. I'm, I'm, I'm going out on my own. That's where this guy's rebellion is seen. See, he believed that he didn't need his father. He believed that he didn't need to live under the rule of his father. And this led him to do what? To dishonor his father in the way that he was living his life. So I want you to think, about this, we are always heading for trouble when we value things over people. We're always heading for trouble when we value things over people. There should have been a value for his dad and the sacrifice that he made. And instead, I don't care about you, man. Just give me mine. I got to go. We're always, always in the way of trouble when we value pleasure more than duty. We just want to have fun. My grandpa used to tell me, hey man, work, out, work hard now, play later. Because none of us want to hear that. Because we all want to play now. We all want to have fun now. We all want to get ours now. And then what happens? Then we end up paying the price later on. And so we have to make sure we have the right. We are always heading for trouble whenever with the, the distant scenes of, are of more value than the blessings that we have right here. I can't wait to leave. I can't. Come on, y'all. Some of y'all said this. I can't wait till I'm 18. I'm out. Maybe you didn't say it like that, but you said something like that somewhere in that general area. And then suddenly you were out and you were like, man, I want to go home. <laughs> Went to that refrigerator and was like, man, this doesn't work like the refrigerator at home. Glory to God. When I was at home, I would, I would drink the last of the milk, go to school, come back. Boom, there was milk there when I opened it. Man, I do that here, and there ain't nothing in there when I come back. Hello. <laughs> There's somebody missing in this equation. That's why. <laughs> But we have this, this, this mindset where we're so forward-looking and, and can't wait to go. And man, we'll fall short. The worst judgment, the worst judgment. I told you, some of you had questions, but somebody said this to me a long time ago, man, and it just hit me hard. But the worst judgment from God is when there is success in our rebellion. The worst judgment from God is when there is success in our rebellion. Everything the prodigal son went through, that was because God loved him. That is because God was showing him mercy. Everything that he experienced was God saying, hey, I haven't forgotten about you. But there's other folks that, man, they live their life. And one of the questions that we receive is, how do you witness to someone who is content being an atheist and gets upset anytime you reference God? It's a tough question, huh? How do you do that? Someone you love, someone you care about. How do you, how do, you do that? Well, first of all, you have to realize that person is experiencing 
the worst kind of judgment because their life is okay. They're, they're, because their life isn't turned upside down, they don't think they need God. What do I need your God for? You need God because you're weak. Hello. Ever heard that? You need God because you can't do it on your own, not realizing, oh, you're not doing it on your own. <laughs> you're, not, you're not doing it on, you think you are, but you're not. Somebody's providing that air in your lungs because you can't do that on your own. Somebody is, has created you in a way that you are able to walk and able to live. You're not doing it on your, you may think you're doing it on your own, but you are not. How do you deal with that person? Let me say it like this. Sometimes defending the faith is simply begging God to open someone's eyes to their true condition. It's loving them, not arguing with them. It's showing them the love of God. It's being the light in the midst of wherever you find yourself with them. You got to realize something. The argument has already been won by them. Hello? Hello? They're not, they're not trying to hear your defense of the faith. They're not trying to hear how you can prove to them the existence of God. No, they've already won that argument. So what do you do? In those moments, what you do is you cry out to God for mercy in their lives. And you look for the opportunity when God will open that door. I love Scott's story. I didn't hear it until the first service. So the first service, I was taken aback, right? I was like, wow. I, I, I didn't know about the call when he was 20 years old. Man, that would rock me to the core to get a phone call, and it and, and obviously did, right? It shook him as it should have. But, but, but this moment, but hey, listen, I, I'm just saying that moment, other people have had those similar moments and they didn't come to faith. Other people have had those moments and they just moved on with their life, became bitter towards God, didn't cry out to Jesus for salvation, cursed God even more. That, those things have happened, so what do we have to do? We need to be praying for these folks to be drawn near to God through his goodness, through his love, through his grace. The second thing that we see in this story, say this with me, say repentance is an unseen work of grace. Repentance is an unseen work of grace. Verse 17 says this, it says he came to himself. And, and, and he didn't just figure this all out on his own. I mean, you think about this guy. He was over there. He had this inheritance. He thought that money was never going to run out. All of a sudden, it runs out. He thinks, well, I'm young. I can work, and I can get my own inheritance. A famine hits. Hello. Now, all of a sudden, he finds himself in a, in a servitude position to someone. He is over here in this situation where he is a Jewish boy meaning that he is a kosher kind of guy. Pork was something that was a no-no. Guess what his job was? His job was to look after the pork. He couldn't eat the pork. Hello, he wouldn't have done that anyway. But his job was to take care of the swine. And he was there and, and he was like, my goodness, I am over here starving. And my dad's paid servants, man, they have bread and to spare. Oh my goodness. But this guy was in such a bad place that he's like, man, I would eat the pig's food. Forget the pigs. I'll eat their food. That's rough. But notice this. He comes to himself. I can assure you day after day after day, something was happening in the background. There was something that was, he didn't see it. He didn't even realize, well, he's trying to fight. He's going to suck it up. He's going to get through this famine. And yet he finds himself at that moment where he comes to himself. Listen, it's the same thing. Think about your own faith walk. Did you just like all of a sudden one day wake up and you're like, I need Jesus? I don't think so. <laughs> Most of you were talking to God for a long time, arguing with God maybe. You were going through stuff. Or you had somebody talking to you about Jesus. If mom, if you're online, she uh, sat down one day and she read a scripture to me. And she was like, hey, let me read this, this verse to you. And I'm like, yeah, go ahead and read the verse to me. And so she reads, you know, Proverbs chapter one, I think verse eight or nine. And she said, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Only fools despise wisdom and instruction. And man, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, man, I go get in the car with my friends. And I sit down and I'm like, man, we're a bunch of fools. And like, what are you talking about? I'm like, yo, my mom just read this verse. And so I'm preaching to these guys. I don't even know because God is working in me. And I explain to them, you know, and, and I tell them, we, we, but we do the same. We, we, we reject instruction. We reject wisdom. And I'm like, yeah, go ahead and roll the blunt. Man, shut up, bro. I don't want to hear all that. That's what they said. They, they didn't want anything to do with my Jesus. And he wasn't even my Jesus yet, but he was working on me. Hello. 
He was, he was already dealing with it. that work of grace that is operating, that is taking place inside his people's life. Repentance is usually at work in hearts long before the moment of decision. Thankfully, this young man's circumstances led him home. See, defending the faith in an evangelistic context must be, hear me now, it must be tactful, but above all, it must be Holy Spirit led. And so you would think, right, like we're going to doors and we're just knocking randomly. You're right. We're just walking or through a neighborhood and we're knocking on a door. We don't know who's going to come out. Right? He told you about, you know, Goliath that came out and was like, hey, we don't want God. I don't want Christians in this neighborhood. And, you know, we had another experience with another gentleman. He was there. We're talking to him for a couple of seconds and we're like, hey, you know, we're Christians. And I think when we got the word Christians halfway out of our mouth, he started grumbling. And we're like, hey, can we pray for you? He's like, no, no, I don't want prayer. I'm like, okay. And he's like, you see that on the door? And we're like, no. And so we saw this little thing and he's like, I'm Jewish. I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, so I wanted to tell him, you know, well, Jesus was Jewish. So you're in good company. But that wasn't the Holy Spirit. That was me, right? Like I wanted to jab him for Jesus and be like, yeah, I felt good about myself, right? Like, we're not supposed to be jabbing people for Jesus. We're, we're, we're not supposed to be up there. Like, I'm taking, wait, wait a second. I need to just shut up and just be like, don't say anything and say, okay, sir, God bless you. Because then you know what happens? Then I become that sarcastic Christian. Then I be that person that I become that person. That's how I go, you're just like all these other. People. And I didn't do anything except just, you know, tell him a fact. Tell him. But did I need to tell him that fact? Obviously not. I didn't need to go there, but you have to be spirit-led. Why? Because this young man was on his way home. Now, if you would have been that Christian that would have met him, would you have helped him home or would you have got in his way? Would your witness have been spirit-led? See, because here's what, church, we're looking at this story, like this is so disconnected from us. Do you know how many prodigals are sitting out here, are living in our neighborhoods that we work with? People that God is already working on their heart, that repentance is already happening in their life, that God's grace is, is doing something, that there's a seed that was sown in their lives. God is at work, man. Are we being sensitive to the Lord? And listen, you, you may not, and I thank God, somebody already told me in first service, they want to come out with us when we go, you know, to, to go and knock on doors. And so I'm encouraging you to do something. Listen, it's out of my comfort zone. That's not my wheelhouse. I, I mean, Scott does all the talk. And I think one time I, I initiated a conversation and it's because I was forced to, I was like, I thought she spoke Spanish and I was like, oh man, I got to step up right now. So not only am I going to speak Spanish, but I am also going to witness. Hallelujah. But outside of that, right, so, so the point is that we need to be sure that we are sensitive to what the Spirit of God is already doing or we're just going to get in the way. We're going to get in the way. We, need to be, we, we don't need to get in the way. We need to be sensitive to what God is doing. Because on the other side of that, as Scott shared, he, there's, there's a woman sitting at a table who is weeping, who is broken over her situation. And guess what? Just randomly, right, randomly. It's no randomly in the kingdom. We come into this neighborhood. Somebody needs prayer for, for their family and what they're going through. Why? Because God's spirit is there. He's moving. And man, I want to be part of that mission. I want to be part of what God is doing, whether it's on the neighborhood knocking on doors, whether it's in the mall, whether it's wherever I am. I want to be on mission and led by the Spirit of God because what? God is working. Prodigals are out there coming to themselves. And we got to be sensitive to what God is doing so we can be part of bringing these people into the kingdom. The third thing I'd ask you to repeat after me is this. Say, rejoicing happens when the lost are found. Rejoicing happens when the lost are found. You sounded terrible when you said that too. Like, oh, rejoicing happens. Hallelujah. Come on, y'all. Rejoicing happens when the lost are found. The Father rejoices. That's what Jesus said, right? He talked about the shepherd and the lost sheep. And he said, man, there's rejoicing in the presence of angels. I already clarified this for you earlier on in the year. It does not say that the angels are the ones rejoicing. It says there is rejoicing in the presence of angels, which means what? That God is in the presence of angels rejoicing over every soul that comes home. Hello. 
That's what happens. There's rejoicing that occurs the same way that that shepherd who found that sheep because that sheep has value for the shepherd. And so one sheep matters a lot. That woman with the coin, when she found that one coin, it mattered a lot. And this lost son that comes home, oh, he mattered a lot. Let's look at this father and the way that he deals with his son because there's rejoicing that is there. Verse 20, it says, and he arose, speaking of the son, and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I love that picture. He didn't, he didn't wait for it. He, he wasn't sitting on his rocking chair in front of his house saying, okay, wait till that boy comes over here and apologizes. He didn't do that. He wasn't, he wasn't waiting for his son to humble himself. No, the father saw his son. You know how it is. You see somebody, you see their silhouette from a distance and you just know how they walk. Come on now. Well, that's my child right there. I know that one. I, they, they, that, there's no question, right? Like, like I know he saw his son coming home and he runs out and falls on his son's neck. Verse 21, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. And look at this, but the father, he didn't let him finish. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him <clears throat> and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Listen to this. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. There is rejoicing that occurs when a rebel comes home. Hallelujah. There is a joy that occurs. The father rejoiced over the son. And here, here we have to understand this again. Defending the faith in that evangelistic context, us defending the faith, you can, you and I can become a vessel that is doing what? That is bringing someone home. That's encouraging. We can be part of someone who is on their way home. That's the reason why our testimony matters so much. That's the reason why living for the glory of God matters so much. That you are like, man, wait a second. I'm living for his glory, for his honor, because you know what? Someone could be on their way home and I may be the door. Hello. I may be that person that God uses in order to bring them in to the kingdom. But not just that, because let me tell you this, it's not just about, I love the story of the young man that's 6'3", you said 14, right? That's what you said. 14. I mean, this young man's coming to forge, so he's with older men. He's hearing God's word. He's sitting with Scott at a table. He is being discipled and developed. Listen, it's not just about knocking on a door. It is about what? Making disciples. Helping people grow in their faith. And so this young man comes home. His father does some things that for us, you know, the illustration of him running and hugging and clothing his son and restoring him, it may get lost on us, right? Because we don't, we don't really get it. I just told you about Josiah. Some of your hearts are moved because you love him. Praise the Lord. And you can imagine, you remember when your own children, that happened with them or you're praying for that to happen. But, but here's the thing that, that, that happens that we have to look at. We have to back up. And we have to go back to that culture. And the one thing, men did not run in that culture. That was undignified. I'm not, especially running to some rebel. Hello. But you know what his dad did? He picked up his robe. He tied that thing and he ran to his son. He left all of his dignity on the porch. He saw his son from afar and he began to run to his son. He did something else because he ran to him and he wrapped himself around his son. And, and, and we don't even think of the significance of any of this, right? But if you look at Deuteronomy 21, verse 18 to verse 21, you know what it says should have happened to that son? That son should have been stoned. See, for you and I, we're like stoning. That's like archaic. Yeah, this is archaic. Hello. Because of that son's rebellion, because of that son's dishonor of his dad, be, because of that, the son was to be stoned. You know what the father did when he fell on him? He said, man, you have to kill me to kill him. He 
ran to his son because you know what? If somebody saw him before his dad got to him, they could pull out the stones and start stoning this boy because he was a rebel. And the father does what? He intercepts all of that. He, he intercepts, falls on his son. And not only that, his son starts telling him, you know, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. And the father goes on ahead, puts on the best robe, puts sandals on his feet, gives him a ring. And you know what? Servants didn't wear any of that. You know what the father was saying? I don't want to hear any of that. You're my son. You're my son. I forgive you. He, he, he didn't let him even get the prayer out. He didn't even let him get the words out, and the Father restores him. Church, I don't know about you, but it excites me to know that sharing the faith offers people liberty and full acceptance by the Father. That should move our hearts, that we're not just part of some, you know, we're, we're just knocking on doors or we're just talking to people. No, 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 this is an opportunity in order to bring people back to that place of forgiveness and acceptance. And I want you to know, don't let it, don't let it miss you. The son knew his sin. The son recognized. He didn't come back saying, Dad, you know, no, no, he, he, he didn't come making excuses. He came back home to repent of his sin. His heart was where it needed to be. And so John chapter 14, and I'm wrapping up with this. John chapter 14, verse six says that Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No one comes to the father except through him. And what we know about the son is what? Is that he was lost. Well, you know what? Jesus is the way to those who are lost. We know that the son was deceived. Jesus is the truth to those who are deceived. The scripture says, the father said it. He said, my son who was dead, Jesus is the life for those who are dead. The beauty of the gospel is that God does not leave us to ourselves to figure it out on our own but he rescues us. And so look, I'm closing, and here is my closing question. Will you commit to the extension of the kingdom via sharing your faith? Will you commit to the extension of the kingdom through the sharing of your faith? Listen, I'm not trying to manipulate anyone. If you say yes God, I want to be part of the extension of your kingdom, and I want to commit to being a sharer of the faith. I just want you to stand right where you are, and I want to pray for you as we wrap this up. Hallelujah, Lord. Let us pray. Father, we humble our hearts before you in this moment. And we thank you because we get to be part of this great mission. We get to be part of what you are doing in this earth, God. And so, Lord, you see our hearts, Lord God. I'm the first one that wants to respond and say, yes, God, I want to commit to extending your kingdom. I want to commit to extending your kingdom in this earth through the sharing of my faith. And so I pray for myself. I pray for my brothers and sisters. Let boldness overwhelm our lives, God, to sharing the gospel. Let us not be able to be silent any longer, my God, with the sharing of the faith. Lord God, fill us with your spirit. For those that are in this place and even those who are joining us online that have said yes to you, spirit of the living God, fill us that we may go forth in power, in might, and in wisdom. Help us, God. Thank you for joining us. We hope you were blessed, encouraged, and challenged to walk out your faith this week. If you would like to give to support our ministry, you can in the following ways. Thank you for the ways you support us. God bless, and we hope to see you next Sunday.